Weston, and we are going to talk through some FTC program, um, how to manage hardware using uh, Android Studio as your programming environment. So without further ado, yeah, that all looks good. And just double checking everything. Um, pull up my questions, Q and A. Oops. Um, sorry, just give me a second to get my Q and A up here. Um, thank you, Georgia. All right, uh, so we're going to go on through this. So let's talk through what we're going to do. Um, I mean, my name is Vince Weston. I am a technical evangelist with Dell. Um, and you can reach me as Vince Weston at gmail.com. Um, I have not seen uh, the GitHub version for this year's game be released yet. Um, part of it is going to be because there will be multiple things in that that are going to be tied to the scoring and such for this year, and they weren't going to let you see any of that um, until after the game was released. Uh, my understanding is that should be pretty quick. Um, you can use the latest from last year's game to start all of this off and begin work, and then you can update um, as usual, right? Save your team code, um, reload the, the code like GitHub, just like you would in the middle of the season, reapply your team code, and away you go. So um, that should work just fine. Um, so I'm a, I'm a mentor, a kind of free form around Georgia, help various teams, um, many of them in the Marietta League, but I haven't signed up for Marietta League yet, I guess, um, but uh, available to help teams. And so feel free to reach out to me if you can use some help on some of this. Um, today, we are going to go through um, the software side of things. So we're going to talk about Android Studio and all. Um, talk some about this strategy about how to build winning robots. Um, how do you get Android Studio? How do you set it all up? How do you get it configured on the phones? How do you write some code? We'll be jumping through some sample code. Um, and so we'll go make all that available. I'll post the sample code that we had um, from last year that you can play with. Um, we're working on some stuff for some other drivetrains as well. If you were in the, the session from nine o'clock this morning and you looked at the Rev hardware and the Rev control hub. Um, we also talked about a couple of drivetrains and we've got uh, code available uh, for some of those drivetrains, the swerve drive, the differential swerve, um, and you know, which is yet, uh, and the new two wheel swerve that we're working. So um, need help with some of those kind of things, uh, working with a couple of uh, the other mentors and alums um, to uh, try and get some train thinking going on for folks. Again, take it as, as something to, to play with and go build whatever you want from there, but just to give people some ideas. All right, so talking through how you go about this, right? We've got hardware. Um, it looks pretty good without software. You know, the robot just sits there. Um, software without hardware, you can have nice code flow, but you're not actually going to do anything. Um, together, you can have a winning robot. I will say as a programmer, one of the most frustrating things with most code is uh, there's a little bit of output on a screen, but there's no, you can't see it moving in the real world, right? It doesn't do anything physical. Um, so programming on robots and watching what you intend and watching them you know, move around the field, watching them attain goals and do those things, really a pretty cool thing. Um, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, so together, you can have good hardware. You can make it achieve all your goals. Um, you've got motors to move things and lift things and pull things and grab things. You've got sensors to give your robot awareness, uh, you know, orientation on the field, location on the field, location of objects. Uh, am I grabbing something or not? Um, software can make teleop easier. You can have preset functions that do things. Uh, from this year, there are going to be disks that are probably going to get launched. So you're probably going to have a fairly, you know, you may wind up with a fairly complicated launch mechanism. Um, and hopefully the programming will be such that the driver will hit a button and things will launch and the, the launch mechanism will just reset itself. Right. And you can write software to do all that with the right servo sensors and, and all the right components to make that happen. So the drivers just drive. Um, and then software to complete your autonomous goals. Obviously, autonomous is all about software. Um, you know, photograph recognition of the zero, one, or four stack of rings and all the rest. So um, lots of great stuff to do with, with sensors. Uh, Android Studio, as a quick overview, um, it, this is, it's called Java, but it's also related to C++. It's derived from C. Um, it's all, you know, basically in the same family. 
Um, so some folks will start with a C or C++ um, book if you've got one of those lying around somewhere from you know, one of us older programmers. Uh, by the Java pieces, you know, there's lots of books available. Um, if you understand any kind of basic code, if you understand Python, if you understand basic C, whatever, uh, not that hard to be able to go program things in Android Studio, especially if you take uh, a default you know, sample of template code that works and then modify it to meet the parameters for your robot. Um, there are a couple of pieces. There's the driver station control. So the driver share, um, runs on the driver control station, which is the phone that the joysticks plug into um, that allows you to drive your robot. Uh, it is also where you will do configuration options like, you know, which motors are plugged in where and all that. <clears throat> Having said that, the driver station program is fixed. Um, the final one for the season will be passed out and updates will be passed out um, in the GitHub package that has all the rest of the code for this. So just be aware of that, be thinking about it. Um, you don't need to download anything off of um, the Play Store. Uh, you can just take the APK in this and do the install using Android Studio. Um, if you do download anything off of the Play Store, odds are you're probably going to get the wrong version. Um, so just be careful. The easiest thing to do is just take the code that comes with the GitHub distribution and push it out to your phone. Uh, robot control program, this is custom for your team. Right? It needs to understand exactly what hardware you have code to manage your wheels, your motors, servos, sensors, lights, um, you know, looking for images, all that kind of stuff. Um, we've got some sample tank code that we used for last year that we'll distribute again. Um, if you've got any trouble, have trouble finding that, um, or the, you know, the deck for this will, is supposed to be posted with the video. Um, any trouble finding anything, send me an email. We'll help you track it down. Um, so it's, it's we have places to start uh, and ideas for how to do things. And the, the goal is for you all to focus on what else you can learn uh, above and beyond a lot of things that are, that are somewhat simple um, that people already know about drivetrains. What new creative ways can you come up with to do things? So that's all pretty cool. Um, so you want to get into this world. Um, you go grab the latest Android Studio. I think it's 4.0 or 4.1 now. Um, so grab Android Studio, install it, do the full install try and skimp on things or install things in funny places. Um, if you wind up doing something like breaking your Android debugger so that ADB doesn't work, um, I will say the easiest way to fix that is just rip Android Studio out by the roots and install it again. Um, so leave the defaults, let it go, take the whole thing, be happy, it'll help you. Um, then you download the FTC, FTC code for this season. Um, there's a link here to GitHub that's the generic FTC app. Within that, there's a link to last year's code. Um, there should be a link there very shortly to the code for this year. Um, and throughout the year, they will keep posting it under the season-based name. Um, so you want to go and grab the stuff for the season and download that. Um, so you have your Android development folder, right? You, you name the pieces for your team. So you'll, you'll take the, um, the, the app master. And instead of just letting it be called App Master, you'll call it, you know, um, and we had some stuff we were playing around with the team number for 5.9. So 99999 dash, you know, diff swerve, right? Or 99999 dash two wheel swerve or whatever version of the code, whatever robot we're working on. Um, so there's a doc folder in there that can be pretty useful. It's got a bunch of stuff in it. Um, everything you want to put in there will go in the folder called team code. Um, don't make changes elsewhere in the code tree, right? Don't go and add things somewhere. Don't go and play with a bunch of stuff. Everything you're going to do other than your XML files for configuration live in the team code folder, and you should just be happy with that. Um, and when you want to fix things, take your your entire Android Studio, right? This this In Android Dev, you'll have the thing named for the robot. Just rename it to dash old, install the new version you just unzip from GitHub, and then copy over the team code. Right. The only thing you should be taking is the team code folder and then XMLs for running the robot, nothing else. So hopefully that helps. Um, and you put your, you got to put your phones in developer mode. Again, you look in the docs, you got to go through and say, yes, I want to do this like 10 times. And boom, you drop into developer mode. Um, you're going to need 
the driver phone in developer mode before you can use Android Studio to push um, the application over, right? So you want to install driver station locally. You gotta be in developer mode on the phone for that to work. So, excuse me for one second. I guess. Touch me, shoe. Sorry about that. Doorbells and all. Um, so when you get a chance to work on the robot, we'll talk about how to do some of the configuration mapping. In fact, actually, we went through all that in the hardware class. Uh, so you open the driver station and you'll um, play with that. It does create an XML file that lives on the robot, um, which will either be on the robot phone or inside the new Rev Control Hub. And then um, you can pull it onto your uh, computer. Um, and we talk about how to do all that with Android Studio, but there's an ADB push and an ADB pull. Um, that was all covered in the hardware class as we talked about how to use the new Rev Control Hub. Um, so that's made all that pretty easy. Um, so on the driver station phone, you only want the one application. Uh, I've seen teams before try and install the driver station and the robot control program on the same phone, thinking that, well, I'll just switch phones or whatever um, later if I want to. Um, the two applications use some similar things around the USB stack. Um, when you plug in things for USB to the phone with the driver station installed, it's trying to grab joysticks. When you plug in things on the robot controller, it's trying to reach out and get to the uh, expansion hubs. And so you have two applications fighting over your USB control and bad things happen. Um, things can go sideways. Sometimes, unfortunately, it works very well until you get in the middle of a match and then suddenly it's like, yeah, sorry, I can't find joysticks or yeah, sorry, I can't find a robot or whatever. Um, so uh, make it simple for yourself. Only have one application on a phone. So the driver station only has driver station. Right? Delete the other stuff. Um, you can use the Android Studio terminal window to do the ADB commands. Um, like I said, if you look under doc slash APK in your GitHub download, you will see um, the release for this. So the actual command is listed here on the screen, ADB install doc slash app slash FTC driver station release.apk, uh, and that will install the APK on your phone. Lo and behold, you now have a driver station. Didn't have to go anywhere or look for anything. Um, so that makes it pretty simple. That's all covered in the documentation on how to set things up. Um, but if you're just taking the short version, you know, this is the short version. If it works for you, great, take this and go. If it doesn't, go read the longer documents on how to do it, right? Um, once you've got that installed, you can run self-inspection to ensure that you've got the phone set up correctly um, and change the name and do all those kinds of things. Um, Rev Control Hub, right, the, the beauty of this, well, there's several things that are really nice. There's no more phone. Um, there's no more phone battery death. There's no more cabling the phone. There's all, all the stuff to deal with phone is gone, um, which is just really nice. Um, the other thing is that you're now, instead of using Wi-Fi direct from just the driver station to the, or to the robot controller rather, uh, you now have actual Wi-Fi hub running uh, within this Rev hardware. And so you're going to access things in a different way. Um, but the beautiful thing is you can have your laptop talking to the control hub and the control hub. So you can push and pull code, right? You, you, the driver's driving around, you see what we're gonna change, you change the code, he pauses, you push new code, the control hub reboots, he's running new code. You don't have to take the cable, plug it in. I mean, we always been doing the unplug it, pull the phone off, plug it into the laptop, change the code, go back, and then, right? Keep breaking all the control, all the, parts either in the phone or the cable ends or whatever, all that is gone, right? You just push the data over Wi-Fi and you're done. Um, that also means that you can leave the debugger on. So within Android Studio, you can be looking at counters and getting some more in-depth debugging information while the robot is on the field being tested. Um, you're obviously not supposed to be doing this kind of thing during actual matches. Um, your matches, you're supposed to not have anything connected except your driver's station. Um, but while you're testing in your, in your lab, Right in your robot room, um, you can certainly use this and be doing extensive debugging. It can help you a lot. Um, I will also point out that on the Rev Robotics site, there is a ton of good doc. Um, it used to be a few pages of things. 
um, they've now got a whole uh, multi-page website. So if you go to the Rev Control System, uh, it shows you all the things about the Control Hub and the Expansion Hub and all the different pieces and all that. Um, so it's a great. And again, I recommend if you're doing that, also look through the slides and materials from the hardware class this morning. Um, go watch the video if you didn't get a chance to attend that one at nine. Um, I think it was good. I gave the class. Um, all right, files on there. You can use ADB here for that as well. Um, so uh, again, use the Android Studio, open it up. You can do ADP commands. Um, do not install the default robot robot app that comes with your GitHub download. There will be one there. It's not designed for your hardware. It's not going to help you. Just skip it. Um, and then when you when you want to do the XML files, right? Because you're when you build your code, it will automatically load it onto the robot. So don't worry about how to get that there. When you do the build within Android Studio, Gradle will build it and then it will install it on the phone. And you're good to go. Or on the, it'll call it a phone, um, but it's the uh, the new Rev Control Hub. All right, so it'll push it into the hub for you. You don't have to manage that. And again, it'll do it wirelessly. Um, but if you want to look at the XMLs for control, um, you can use the command ADB pull. Um, and then it's the, the two file names, right? So from and to. So the from is SD card first, which it will recognize that path as being something that's in the in the phone or the Rev Control Hub. Um, and it'll go to the Android there and Android code there and pull it. Um, and then whatever your config name is. Right, so my config.xml, uh, and then the dot on the end says put it in my default directory, which will be at the top of the tree that you're doing all your code work in. Right, so wherever Android Studio, when you opened your project, the top of the project tree is where it'll put that XML. Right, so the same folder that says docs, that says uh, team code, all those things, right, you will see your XML showing up in there. And then you can push out the same thing, ADB push, XML name, Right on to slash SD card slash first slash, and it'll drop that out there and it'll be ready to go. So uh, fundamentally, that's the easy way to get that in and out. You can then use a text editor to edit the code on your laptop. Um, do make sure you leave it in text form. If you open it in Word and save it in uh, as a dot doc, uh, it, it's not going to push over right. It'll just garbage things up and the, it, it will show up in the list and you'll go to use it and it'll be like, yeah, there's nothing here because right? it won't be able to interpret it. So it doesn't have great error reporting. Um, when you when you're on the driver station and you say open an XML file or choose one to configure, if it can't parse it well, it just pretends like it's empty and it'll overwrite it with zeros, basically flush everything out. So, um, you know, keep it as a text file, uh, text format XML file. Um, and it, and once you've got that done and you think you're right, you go to the driver station. You run self inspect. The driver station can do self inspect of both the driver station and um, of the control station or the control hub in this case, lo and behold, away we go. All right, so coding fundamentals. Um, the first thing is you're going to do a hardware map because you're doing a robot. Uh, ro so for robots, you need something that defines, I have software concepts, there's physical hardware in the real world. How do I, how do I bring these two together? Uh, and so the hardware mapping is the definition of the, the instances or the handles that'll control the hardware. So you'll have, you know, there's the concept in the code of a motor. So what you say is, well, in the hardware map, I need a motor, it's this type of motor, I'm calling it this name, you can find it here in the hardware map. You know, this is my motor and this is the, the variable name that I'm creating and I want you to use this variable to control that version of the hardware, right? So uh, if you look in the mapping functions that show up in the, in the base code, in the template code, you can see how we're doing the hardware mapping. Um, and for each type of thing, it's like, here's a new variable for a motor. And I do the hardware map, you know, for go find the hardware, walk through the map and find the thing that has this name. The name that you give in the hardware map string matches to the name that's in the XML file. Right. So um, it's fairly easy to, to do the one to one mapping and see how all that works. Um, you're going to do that for motors. You're going to do for servos. Um, they have speed, power, direction, position stuff. Um, when you create them, you can also do things like you can flip the direction. So if you have wheels on the left and right side of the robot, you can have you know, the left wheel run in a reverse polarity as opposed to the right, so that when you send positive power to the left and the right, they both go forward, right? Um, it's important to understand as you're doing math um, for the angles you want and for the power you want and those kind of things. Um, is it on left and right? Is it did you reverse it when you created the device mapping, those kinds of things? 
Um, it's going to be easier on the programmers if you set it up so that it it appears that you know positive is forward and backward is negative or consistently the same across all your motors, um, just so you don't have to go crazy. Uh, similarly, if you use like a pair of servers or a pair of motors or something, it needs to be very strong. It needs to um, run with more power. Um, you want to make sure they're turning in the same direction. So if you have two servers that are coming from opposite directions to try and turn the same thing, making one of them be a reverse as you define it in the hardware map will allow you to send them both the same commands and one will just run in the opposite direction. So pretty useful. Um, you've got sensors for lots of things, um, distance, color, weight, magnets for detecting metal or orientation of stuff. Um, those can be very fun. Um, the, there's an IMU. Um, inertia management unit built into the hub that will tell you uh, both the gyroscope, how fast are you moving, uh, both velocity and acceleration in each of the three dimensions. Um, and it can detect gravity. So it will tell you which way gravity is pulling. So you can tell if your robot's being tipped or not. Um, so that's a pretty useful thing to know. Is my robot you know, up on an angle? Because that may change what you're doing, especially if you start climbing hills and things on some other games. Um, but it also has a compass in there to tell you where am I headed, right? And the compass automatically gives you a zero to 360 direction, um, makes it very easy to drive robots and autonomous and figure out how you're oriented on the field. So very cool stuff. Um, drivetrain, you've got motors, so the robot's got to be able to move. So you got to be able to make it coordinate, push the robot in the right direction. Um, you can create a virtual version of your drivetrain. So you send a command that says, you know, move robot and you, you know, give it a direct or an angle and a speed, and it just goes. Um, and it can it can go for a certain distance, it can go for a certain time, you can figure out how you want it to do that. Um, but you can have, you can take all the complexity of motors out of the way, especially when you do complicated things, whether it's you know a, a swerve drive, a differential swerve drive, mechanum, right? lots of those have multiple motors need to move in relation to each other to make certain things happen, um, making a common, abstract version that says drivetrain move my robot this way um, makes it much easier for the, the programmers to set things up and, and make it drivable. Um, and then of course you've got the motors and servos to grab and lift and pull and this year toss um, things around and you may want to again coordinate those in groups. You may have an old index system that's you know on the one hand grabbing in and then taking pieces once they're in and moving them around and lots of fun stuff there. Um, so one of the recommendations that I make for teams, you can go about this multiple ways, um, but when you build your robot, we talked about the hardware mapping, for example, right? So you have code that comes in and says, I have these variables that match the hardware with these names, and I set all this stuff up. Um, you can do that and then um, do it again. So you have, you'll have it for your, your base, um, mode for teleop, you need it for autonomous, you may need multiple autonomous, depending on if you want to set up any options for how you're starting the game. Um, this year, there don't seem to be, other than left or right, there doesn't seem to be a lot that you would need to consider, um, though um, there will be at some point red and blue if you're playing in person, right? Because the, the, uh, the fast attack goals are um, in different positions, um, whether you're red or blue. Um, so you can go do all that and set those up. But it's very easy to take a base op mode that has all of the stuff for your robot. Um, and then you can uh, extend it, right? So it's you derive new code. So the teleop and the autonomous uh, derived from the, the core. And then, for example, your teleop blue would be derived from your teleop uh, base and teleop red would be a slight variation of that. And you change very few things and you just pick and choose out of the menu and you set a couple of variables and that other than that, it's the same teleop for everything. And otherwise you're rewriting huge chunks of code. And of course the problem with fix a variable somewhere, you're gonna adjust a motor somewhere, you're gonna do something in one of these and you're not gonna do it in the others. So I'll walk through that for you in just a second. Um, so, uh, uh, Jason's, Jackson's asking a question about the compass. So yeah, I'll, I'll try and pull some up for that, see if the code that I've got loaded has that in it. If not, uh, I've um, and then tips for using mechanum wheels. Um, so then there are two tips I have for you on mechanum wheels before. Um, 
One is that if you want to drive with mechanum on a vector other than um, forward and back, right? When you want to go sideways, or especially when you want to take some kind of a diagonal, um, be very careful with how you're designing it. Um, in general, uh, it's a challenge to get precise angles with mechanum. Um, driving, you know, forward and back works. Strafing or going sideways works. Strafing, um, trying to go at a 45 degree can work. Um, as long as your robot's meeting the floor fairly evenly. Um, any other trying to do any kind of precision angle is really tough. Uh, and the heavier your robot gets, the worse it is. So if your robot only weighs 10 or 15 pounds, you can do some angles and make some things work. Um, if you are 30 pounds plus, uh, you'll be lucky to go forward, back, and left and right. Trying to do angles on the field becomes complicated um, just because the the robot starts sinking into that uh, soft floor and, it, and you start getting a lot more resistance from the wheels that aren't necessarily helping you move in some of the other directions. Um, the other thing about Mechanum is there, there's two ways to go about keeping the robot wheels all on the floor. One is to build a really stiff frame and keep it absolutely flat. Um, good luck with that. That's really hard. Um, but you know, if, if the wheels aren't all sitting with the same pressure on the floor, then the vector drive doesn't work, right? This is a vector you're using force applied to the wheel at the floor to make the robot move in a certain direction. And if the downward force of gravity on the wheel is different on the different wheels, you get different end results from the vectors you're applying uh, for pressure to rotate the wheels. So um, I, I will say a lot of folks really like mechanum wheels. Um, I'll also say that they, doing anything fancy with them is a real challenge because of the soft floor you're running on if the robot's over 25 or 30 pounds. Um, so just be careful with that. Um, we do have some code samples. Um, they're not in part of what we're uploading, but send me a note. I've got some teams that have done Mechanum. I'm glad to share code samples for how to write a Mechanum. Uh, you, you do a, a rose, uh, compass rows, you know, north, south, east, west, and, and the 45s, and you can drive the robot and any of those things. And again, with a with a lightweight frame, 10, 15 pounds, you can go any direction you want, and it's wonderful. Um, but as you build up all the stuff you need for your season, you often find that it's not as reliable, and then your autonomous doesn't work as well, and you kind of go down a rat hole. Um, but yeah, send me a note. Um, in terms of code, um, let me talk through this. I'll, I'll jump to some sample code, and we'll try and get to the... Uh, and if I forget to show you the, the using the compass, um, remind me again in a bit. So the, the rev tank core, um, we've got the, the core code that is the basics of all the mapping and all that. We built the test program because, well, for example, somebody's mentioning Mechanum, right? In a Mechanum robot, normally when you try and drive it, it's going to try and move all the wheels. Well, if you're trying to fix a motor problem or diagnose something, you want to be able to test a single wheel to a test program that uses all the same hardware map, but you can say, okay, just move the left front, left rear, right front, right rear, right, be able to pick a motor and drive it. Um, or, gee, I've got a servo that does X. I want to test just that one servo without anything else moving, even though it's normally coordinated in my teleop, for example. Right? So um, it can be really useful to um, try and use the uh, test program that does that um, and then, of course, the teleop, and then variations of auto. And you can see this is back from when we had the, the lander and we were dropping off or not dropping off, starting on the ground, and whether you want to delay or not, lots of code like that. Um, so somebody asked about my mechanum thing with, with equal pressure. So, yeah, if you do the stiff frame, the trick is in order to get equal, equal pressure, you have to actually have equal weight on the wheels. So that means everything you add has to be reasonably balanced to the center of the robot or you may need to add weight to the robot in various places to get the pressure on each wheel to be very similar. Um, again, it's just, it's really tough to do as you build a complicated robot. Um, and the heavier you get, the tougher the drag on the floor is in using the vector drive. Um, the, the swerve and differential swerve drive chains um, give you a lot more options around that. They are a little more complicated, um, but um, they get a lot more flexibility. So. On that, so um, let's see. I'm going to actually um, I'm going to walk you through this code real quick in Android Studio, um, and then we're going to try something else. So let's see. This is not showing up properly, so I need to go back to. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and just share my or stop sharing that and just share my whole screen.
There we go. Um, so this is an example of, a, of the tank program we had. All right, so I'm currently in the rev tank core. I'm actually gonna just shut that down so we don't show it the same way and get people distracted. So in the core, right, I've got a comment. This is the core and it's currently disabled. So this is the, the Qualcomm um, picking menu. So it won't, this is the core. It's not, it doesn't do anything, right? It's just the core that defines all the pieces. So you can't use it for teleop. You can't use it for autonomous. Um, so it's not picked, so it's disabled here in terms of the menu system. And that's all that the, the teleop versus um, autonomous does here. Uh, but then you can take this guy and um, in this case, I've got the rev tank core that expands my basic op mode. I define my motors, left front, left rear, right front, right rear. I got a lift motor and some other things, all right? I define all those. I talk about what I want to do with them. Um, and then when I go down into my code, um i do the hardware map so here's an example of a hardware map and notice there's a comment in here it talks about the adv push and pull um so my front left motor is go to the hardware map get a dc motor get the one with the name that says left front all right so that left front comment would be what i have in my xml file when i defined how this was being used um and then i can run them with or without encoders um and then i can have you know other motors and spinners and things um, as a warning, when this says run without encoder, it doesn't mean the encoder doesn't work. Um, if you want to be able to tell the motor, go until you reach this encoder setting, right, as an automated motor function, you need to leave on run with encoder, right? Run without encoder says, I'm never going to ask the motor code independently to do it. I may read encoder values and decide where to stop. But if you do run with encoder instead of run without encoder, you will slow your top end, top performance of your motor down by 25 to 40%, depending on the motor and the settings. So unless you plan to use the, have the motor itself run till it reaches a certain value, you should always start the motors out saying run without encoder. Um, you'll get a lot more performance out of them. Um, and then you can note down here, there's some things about how to set the motor di direction to reverse. Uh, and of course we do debugging after you find them um, to make sure you know where they are. Um, and then this is an example of a servo we were grabbing. A uh, couple other things. So for hardware mapping, um, you wanna map out your battery sensor. So this is a battery voltage sensor we defined up above, go get my expansion hub one um, and tell it I want my voltage sensor, right? You got one in each hub, um, but that will give you a live reading of the current value of the battery just like you see on the driver station. And there are times when you wanna use that. For example, if you're trying to travel at a certain rate of speed or you know, throw things with a, a variable speed motor to make sure you're hitting a certain target, um, when your battery is at 14 volts, you'll get different results from your motor saying run at full speed than you will if your uh, battery is at 13 volts, right? So you may want to adjust the voltage that you apply for certain driver commands or tel autonomous commands based on the voltage you're reading. And that's a real time sensor. So you can reach in and read, get the current voltage. Um, you know, it's, it's a straight up number, right? What is the current volts in a 13.4 or 14.1 or whatever the current battery voltage is, pretty cool. Um, for inertial management, um, there was a question earlier about how to use the compass. So this sets up the IMU, right? Hardware map, go get the IMU um, that you also have to have defined. Right, so you'll notice that in the XMLs that I define, I always make sure the IMU is in there. It's in there by default. Um, make sure you don't drop it out. Um, and then I tell it to use degrees for the angles. Um, and for my acceleration, I want it um, meters per second per second. Uh, got a calibration file. We don't usually use it. I haven't ever found I had to calibrate them. Um, enable the logging. Right, and then you've got an IMU that you can use for other things later. And so we can look at some of that in the code. Um, so fundamentally, that's my hardware map, right? And and you start it, and it doesn't do much. It goes and and does its init, and 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 when you are in the loop, um, all it does is do loop reporting and done, because uh, the function, the higher level function that calls this, runs the actual loop. And when you stop, we shut down. Right? So there's just not a whole lot in here other than the hardware setup, but that means you only do hardware setup once, and you don't do it in the other code. Um, then, for example, if you're in teleop. Right now, this one's going to be in the menu, so I'm going to have a rev tank, 
um, is the group, and it's going to be teleop1, because I've got version 1 of my code. Putting version numbers here in the string is a great way so that when you go into your driver station, if the driver station still says teleop1, you know that the code you were, and you, you set the code in Android Studio to 1.1, right? You know that whatever you did didn't push into the robot, and you need to go back and fix that before you try and figure out why your new change didn't work. Um, so this fits in my rev tank group, and away I go. Uh, but this will show up as a teleop, right? Because I have teleop in front. Um, and then for this, right, I set a couple of, you know, drive power factors and things. Um, I don't do much in startup other than deciding whether I'm going to use my wheels for gradual or not. And then I can simply do things, you know, look at the joysticks, read what I want to do. Uh, I've decided, what I'm, and then this is send a debug message and then move my robot, right? Drive left, drive right. How do I want my tank to drive on the left and right sides? Right, and then I've got things for bumpers to be able to change power and to be able to do other things and, and have some different fun for lifts and, and all the rest of that. Um, and then for autonomous, you have the same kind of thing. Um, this guy is also, again, disabled just like the core was because this is the basic autonomous. This doesn't, you can't actually select this one in the menu. And so here I put all my autonomous stuff. So I've got a state machine here. It decides I'm doing init, start, down, move, whatever, right? I built a default thing. I've got all my states defined. I've got names for them defined. Um, I've got how do I want to start, right? Get my voltage sensor, right? And if it's, in this case, I'm looking, right? If it's over 13.8, my auto is going to start at, at 5 um, as terms of a speed. If it's less than that, I'm going to start at a little higher power, right? So I'm just playing with the default speed of my autonomous based on the voltage I'm reading out of my voltage sensor. Right? And then I'm going to get my positions and go do things. Um, and so somewhere down in here, I think I'm probably even doing turning and looking for turns and all that. It may not be in this code. Um, I was going to look and see, since you asked about the direction, um, I've got to wait. I'm going to see if there's a thing in here to check the direction. Yeah, here's my get orientation. Um, is the current heading minus the start angle. So I've got somewhere here I'm doing the current heading. So let me just go up to the top of the loop and see if I can explain. I just want to make sure I had it in this code. Um, right. So in this loop, right, I run along and then I have a code that says check orientation. So check orientation is down in the core. Um, I've got a couple of functions down here in the end. Um, check orientation, right? So from whether I'm in teleop or an autonomous, this is mostly an autonomous. If I want to know which way I'm pointing, um, I call this function. It says my angle is equal. Basically, go read from the IMU and tell me where I am. Right? X, Y, Z, X, Y, or Z, Y, X is my angle order for this one. Right? I'm reading in degrees, um, doing the intrinsic reference, and I just look at the first heading, right? The first angle. That first angle is my angle 0 to 359.9 or whatever. Um, and because I'm doing all this in degrees, um, and I'll get my current heading, and away we go. So it's it's really simple. Um, that is literally all it takes to know which way your robot's heading. And in terms of autonomous, right now in my code, it's pretty easy to say, right, go and turn. I've got a check down here for my, um, right, get 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 reorient checks my orientation. Um, check the drive state. Basically, you know, if I reach the speed I want or the orientation I want. Right, just sitting in the bottom of a loop. So I know I'm kind of flipping through some of this, but um, it, it makes it pretty easy to just decide, you know, what do I want to do next? Where do I want to go in my state machine? Um, all right, so that's the fundamentals. And then, so that's the default autonomous. Then, for example, this is the blue ground. So this is, I'm on the blue side and I'm starting on the ground, right? So we had the lander where you either latched or you were starting on the ground. So on the blue one on the ground, um, what am I going to do? I'm going to set, am I red? I've got a variable in here, so I said, am I red to false? So that the other code that I had knows that I'm false. My delay is set to zero. I don't want to wait. I want to go. And am I hanging at the start? I set that to false. I call something that shows the autonomous goals, which will cause them to show up in the log and on the driver station. So when I'm sitting there and I hit init right on my code, it'll show up and say, hey, by the way, I am doing uh, blue. And I'm on the ground. I'm doing no delay. I'm ready to go. Right? And so you get verification on the phone in the results that you picked the right code. But this is the entire code for this autonomous, right? It sets the variable, so I'm not red, right? Set red to false. 
um, set delay to zero, set hang start to false. And then other than that, I just let everything fall through. Right? And so other than that, I'm doing everything that's here in, in the rev tank auto. Um, so I don't have to write all kinds of extra code. And so I've got one for, for blue, I've got one for red, I've got one for hang, I've got one for not, I've got one for a 10 second delay, I've got one for a no second delay. And I just make a, a collection of these little programs. I pick one out of the menu list by the name that goes right here, right? Um, and that shows up in my menu of autonomous code in my application when I'm doing driver station and done. So it's really easy to have a whole bunch of autonomous options that set very specific values, but don't have independent code for all the work that has to get done in autonomous. Right, so you have one real autonomous program, and then you have a bunch of little programs that set variables. Um, and then you can easily have all your, your variable options to deal with things the way you'd like to. So I hope that helps with the thoughts on that. I'm going to go back to the slides. But that should have the concept here of, right, there's a test program um, that comes off the core. There's a teleop program that comes off the core. And then autonomous. So things like the move robot code, right, all live down in the core. So if you're building mechanum drives and you build the whole compass road, which way do I go? That code lives in the core. And so you just call move robot, whether you're in autonomous or teleop, and it does all that work for you. So there's one version of that code that you don't have to try and keep updated in multiple places. Um, I've seen folks try and keep it updated in different ways, and it usually ends badly. Um, so you'll show um, uh, the initial management use it. It's a, a Bosch sensor. Uh, it's really cool. Again, heading, roll, pitch, gravity, all that stuff is available there. Um, there's code in the samples. I just walked through the one on this, so it's got the, the a way to do a, a, an IMU guided autonomous. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, you want to do your autonomous that way. You especially you don't want to use like gyros and then reset. You know what your position should be on the field, so you go until you get to a certain angle, but then when you move the next time, you just go to the new angle, and it's an ang absolute angle on the field. It's not, oh, I turned 45 degrees here and 20 degrees there and 45 there because you have successive error, so each time you turn, you're building on error, and you're less likely to be where you want to be. Um, this gives you a fixed field-based compass, so you say, okay, after I've done three turns, I want to be going, you know, 90 degrees, right, straight off to the side, you don't have to worry about that 90 degrees having cumulative error in it. Your target is always the same 90 degrees. Um, I showed you the link to the battery sensor. It's part of every red pub. You should use it. Right? It's information about your robot that's critical to how it runs. Um, autonomous, use sensors. Um, you certainly have the orientation sensor. It's built into every robot. I don't know why so many teams aren't using it because I showed you. It's really simple, right? One call to check it. Then you've got the value and use it everywhere else in your code to see where you are. And the next time through the loop, you just read the current value again. Um, color sensing, distance sensing, um, encoder values that you can read. Again, if you even if you say um, run without encoders, uh, the encoders are still there. The values are still good. The motor itself just won't slow you down when you reach a target. You have to do that monitoring yourself. And your code's probably complicated enough you want to do that anyway. Um, it is much harder to code than the teleop. Um, you need to figure out everything, and you're not going to think of everything until you get on the field, so you're going to have to learn. Um, this does take the majority of the programming time because um, you're going to do all the fancy stuff, right? You're looking at how do I figure out how to use the ori field orientation, how to do the other things, how do I make all that work? Um, and then you can, you can have preset things like alliance color and where are you in the field and start delay and all into separate uh, code to make that really simple. Um, and the way we implemented this was a state machine. Folks have done that off and on. You can do other code. I think a lot of the other code is more complex. Um, the idea behind a state machine is every time I go through the loop, I know what state I'm supposed to be in. What am I? Oh, I'm moving toward the wall. Okay, I've reached the wall. Now I need to do this. Okay, now I'm moving toward this. And every time through the loop, you just check, okay, I, I've been in this state. Do I move to my next state yet? Right? And so I just keep, I, I always know where I am and what I'm doing, and I can jump between states without having to jump around in the flow of code. Um, so it's a reasonably um, focused way of building autonomous. Um, there's some folks who have some much better, um, more complete, you know, just draw a line and let the robot go follow the line you drew. Um, that's great. Um, great code to have. Uh, and you might talk to some fellow teammates or some fellow teams within Georgia. Um, the Smita Syndicate was doing some really great stuff with that. So um, you might talk to them. Uh, again, part of this is to share. Once you've used it for a season, right, you can't count it as new invention for the year. 
Um, but if you're sharing things you invented in prior seasons, that's still helping other teams. So people are glad to share code usually. Um, teleop. So you're looking at joysticks, you're reading the customer, the joysticks from the end user. Um, and of course, all the buttons. Um, some things that you want to do to help make the, the driving easier. Um, it's really nice if you have a button on your robot that says go slower versus go or go faster. Um, when you're trying to turn a robot 20 or 30 degrees um, to, to align directly with something to go pick up a piece on the floor, you, you don't want the robot suddenly doing, you know, 180. You want to make it so that it turns slowly. Um, on the other hand, when you're racing around the floor trying to get to the other side and jog around things, you want quick reactions. You don't care about precision. All right? So it, having a single button that the user can hold down or something, maybe one of the triggers um, to say slow down or speed up, um, can be really nice for them to be able to drive better. Now, the only way they're going to do that with muscle memory is if they spend the time driving the robot. Right? You want your drive team to spend time driving. You want them to get used to it. You want them to use the controls. Um, another thing that can be really helpful is if your robot tends to go back and forth on the field without turning around, um, most drivers can't drive backwards well in their head. Um, they get left and right confused and things become a mess. Um, you can put a button on the robot where they just press it and now, you know, what looks like the back is treated as the front and the joysticks work and you drive it. So you drive it forward one way and then you flip the button, you drive it forward the other way. Um, it can be much easier for the humans to do that and the robot doesn't care, right? You can tell it to flip the orientation and the software can do that in a heartbeat. Um, so think about things like that that you can do to make the driving easier for the humans because um, we got to help the poor humans out. They're only so capable, right? Um, Manipulation control, if you're going to throw something, if you're going to grab something, the more you can automate it, the, uh, assuming you've got the right mechanism so automation is useful, you know, reach out and grab something or set a feeder and make it come in until it detects that you fetch something. So in this game, right, you can bring in a ring and once a ring comes in, you may want to pause until you do something with the first ring before you suck the next one in, right? Or Geo, you want to detect when you've got three in, don't grab anymore, right? Because uh, you don't want to have four in your robot. So, you know, how are you going to take care of those kind of things? Um, sensors can do, um, you can find lines, right? The lines on the ground can be very useful to be able to find. Um, the white line in autonomous, right? There's points for parking on that. So knowing where you are and being able to poke, park on that can be very useful. Um, being able to check the weight of things. Sometimes you've got to pick things up that are heavy. Um, or even in this case, if you're going to pick up uh, the Weeble, um, uh, you know, the little wobbly device. I just keep thinking of it as Weebles because that old name. When we were kids, we had these little Weebles toys that um, fell over a lot like that or didn't fall. They just wobbled around. Um, so you grab the wobble. Um, when you pick it up, um, the weight on the arm that's holding it is going to change. Um, and you could have a pressure sensor on there um, that could detect this shift in weight so you could know whether or not you've got a good grab. Now you're doing that in teleop, you may not care. Um, but you know, in autonomous, checking for you know color to see the nice orange ring come in to say, hey, I've got a ring where I want it to be. Right? You can do those kind of things where you can do touch sensors. There's a ring here and it's pushing on things. Um, all those kinds of things can be useful. Um, you know, having lifts or angle things that stop at different heights. Um, all those can be useful things to have sensors for. Um, and you can automate what the teleop guys are doing with that. Um, so feedback. How do you know what your robot is doing? Um, how do you know what the time frame is? How do you know what's going on? Um, so, for example, when you're picking up... Um, the rings, right? Yes, there's a ring that came in. If your robot is somewhere detecting that there's a ring in the robot, you might have two or three flags on the robot. Um, and so when one ring is in and ready, you put a flag up. When a second ring is in, you put a second flag up. If you have a third ring in, you put a third flag up. And then when the guys are driving, like, hey, I got three flags. I shouldn't go. I don't need to go near any more rings because I'm not going to bring any more in. Right. But you, if it's difficult to see the robot, I know in this year's game, you're standing on the side right next to where your robots are moving. Um, but in case you can't see in there well, if you've got big complex mechanisms, whatever, um, you can have a flag turn on. Um, you can use LEDs if you do them under the right control. Check your rules very carefully. Um, you can even have some of them change color. Um, you also have to figure out if your team is going to notice things. So you may have to be a little obnoxious with it. But you can actually spit sounds out on the Android phones. Um, which I don't think is an option in the control hub. I haven't seen a speaker on it. Um, but in competition, the sound that the phone makes is so small compared to most of the stuff that's going on that it's really difficult to notice. So you need something that goes off. 
Um, the other thing we've seen very useful is a warning that says, hey, by the way, Endgame's coming up in 10 or 15 seconds, right? You've got a timer running in the robot. You know when um, your two minutes started for your teleop. So you know when you're a minute and 15 seconds in and you can put a flag up that basically goes, hey, guys, go get ready for Endgame because you get 15 seconds to be ready for Endgame, right? So you can say, and then the, the coach can be saying, hey, yeah, let's make sure that the wobbles are on the correct side of the field so we can score them in endgame. Let's make sure the human player has reset um, the hotshot goals. Right? Let's make sure that all the things that we need to be ready for in endgame are ready for endgame. Um, so go for that. And, and that may include go and get some rings and get ready to shoot the hotshots quickly. Right? Um, whatever your priorities are. But if you have a flag go up on the robot, it can remind you because we keep saying, oh, yeah, we're going to remember. We're going to focus on this. And then, you know, the, the coach even gets very distracted in the games in most cases and forgets to look at the clock, right? And all of a sudden, you know, end game starts and now you've got 30 seconds. Well, it takes you 10 seconds to get in the right place to be able to do end game. And now you've got 20 seconds to do your end game and you're pressured, right? So you can, you can have your robot give you feedback and just be thinking about some of those kind of things. Um, so uh, how do you manage for, for complex stuff, right? You're not the first problem to solve most of these problems. Um, you know, when the team came up, when the Wheeler team came up with a, a the four wheel swerve that they did uh, a couple of years ago when they went to Worlds, uh, they designed the swerve drive. They got all the parts working. And they're like, ah, code on this is really tough, right? Went out, did some searching, found some fundamental code that even had an XML spreadsheet you could use to play with things. Our code's a little different. We've enhanced some things. We're adding some auto. Okay, we can take this as a base. And we can start from that and, and we can acknowledge it, right? In our notebook, we say, gee, we found this code. It does, you know, a base version of all this. And then we did this, this, and this to make it better and make it apply better to our robot and make it work well, right? Um, so you want to always document um, where you get things. If you find code, um, you should put comments about that in the code. We got this piece of code or this idea about this code from this place and have links to it. Um, that way, if anybody asks you and you pull up the code on your laptop, you're looking through it and say, oh, yeah, we got that from here, right? And people can go verify it and you can look at all that. Um, you know, nobody's going to give you 100% of your code. You should always acknowledge what you're getting, that where you're getting things from. It's great. But you're not the first people to solve most of these problems. So go out and try them, right? Now, that's not, again, you're not going to find code that exactly works for you. You're going to need to adapt it. So the general problem may have been solved. The specific problem may not be. Um, if you've got a really big problem, make it into pieces, right? First, I got to make the wheels move forward, backward, various speeds, and be able to control all that. Then I can have them all move together. So once I got four mechanum wheels that all move the way I want to, then I can apply a vector drive to them and make them move in coordination to make my motors uh, and robot drive the way I expect it to. Um, you can display sensor reading. So there's room on your uh, drive st driver station to give feedback. So what am I reading for the joystick? What are my current headings, right? What is the, what is the IMU telling me my current heading is? Uh, what, where do I think I am in my state machine? Uh, if I'm doing teleop, what do I think I'm trying to do to help the driver? Am I running in slow mode or fast mode? What is my orientation? What is my state of anything that I'm trying to help them with? You know, what, how much time do I have left before in game? All those things you can put into your status log on the bottom of the driver station. So lots of great stuff. You can do that. Don't hesitate to do it. Um, you know, and consider when you're exploring hardware ideas, what's it going to be like to program this, right? You can have the greatest idea in the world. If you can't write software to control it, it's not going to do you a lot of good. Um, similarly, if you can write really complex code, but your drivers can't understand how to use it, not going to do you much good. Um, there are mentors out there, right? Mentors know software, several of them. Um, find a software mentor, ask some folks. Uh, you don't have anybody else, send me a note. We can talk about things. Um, but there's, there's a ton of resources out there on the web. Uh, and this isn't just for FTC, right? Professional programmers, oh, I've got to solve this problem. What should I do? Well, the first thing I should go do is go see if somebody else already solved the problem and if I can adapt what they've done to help me solve my new problem. So that's something that you're going to do for a long time. Um, all right, other challenges. You will write bugs. Um, there's, a, there's a comment a guy once said, you know, a kid comes up, five-year-old or so, oh, Dad, what are you doing? Um, I'm, I'm debugging my code. What's debugging me? Well, I wrote some things that weren't right, so now i got to go fix them. And, of course, what's a five-year-old say? Well, wouldn't it be easier just to write your code without any bugs? Um, yeah, there are a few people on this planet who can do that. I'm not one of them. 
Um, in general, you're going to write code. Um, the earlier you find them, the easier it is to fix them. Having separate test routines, testing in modules can help a lot. Um, code can fail. Um, sometimes software can fix that or detect it at least. I said, if your robot's tipping up, odds are you've got a wheel on a wall or on something you're climbing, and that's probably no good. Um, we had one robot climb on top of another robot uh, a couple seasons ago. That's no good, right? If you find you're tipping up more than 20 or 30 degrees, you probably want to stop. It's probably not what you need to be doing. Um, also, watch your sensors. Some of the, especially the distance sensors, will be reading along. Yeah, I'm at five centimeters. I'm at four centimeters. I'm at 35 meters. I'm at I'm at two centimeters. Right? You can get some various things. Test your sensors. Right? Without any complex code running above them, just sit and watch it. Right? Run it around the field and watch the sensor value, and or maybe write some code to look at it and tell you how close it stays to what it's supposed to be. I'm running along. It looks good. Oh, it jumped way over there and came back, or it jumped over for two readings and came back. Right. If you figure out how your sensors are feeding data to your code, you can do a much better job of writing code to deal with that. So your robot doesn't suddenly say, oh, I'm way too far away. I got to speed up. Oh, wait a minute. I was already there. I got to slow down. Um, you know, sensor readings that aren't what you expect will cause you more headaches in writing code um, than a lot of the other things you're going to do. Um, the season is short relatively, right? It's, it's well, normally about six months. This year it's going to be a little longer, um, but the current plan is, Right, state championship beginning of February. So that doesn't leave you a whole lot of time. Fairly short. Um, writing the perfect solution is going to take a long time. Writing really complex code may mean you're going to spend a lot of time debugging it. Um, simple is good. Figure out a way to break big things into small things. Um, fix, use the simple things and, and get more complicated if you need to. Um, but there's a pro, um, an old KISS principle out there, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Um, don't complicate things you don't need to. Um, and remember, you're going to share things across your seasons. Um, so you want to do two things with that. One is you want to put good comments in your code and in your um, uh, in your engineering notebook to make sure you understand what you're doing. How did you build it? What was the concept? What is the math behind it? Right? I mean, yeah, you're building this part in CAD to do this, but how did you come to that concept? Right? Document that, put it in your notebook, put it with the part so you can reference it later. Um, and of course, when you're using things from a prior season, right? If you've got a drive frame from last year that was really wonderful, you think it'll be great this year, start your notebook off with, hey, yeah, last year's note, last year's drivetrain was awesome. We're using it again, right? Think of it as almost the same as if you used a drivetrain from another team in terms of you don't deserve any credit for it because that was last year. And the competition is really about what you're building in terms of all your innovation is all about what you're doing this year. Right, so if it's the same robot as last year, and you try and say, "Well, yeah, we, we built the whole thing this year," um, anybody who knew you from last year might ask a couple questions about that. Um, fine to use it, fine to take credit for it, but again, it doesn't count toward innovation for this year. Sharing it and getting other teams to use it, awesome. Get somebody else to use it. Get documentation. You know, get them to send you a link back and a picture of what they're building. That's great. Right. Um, so. Um, Jackson's asking about the programs. Um, glad you're finding the session useful. So yes, we will, um, all the codes available, send me a note. Um, we're about done with this. Wow, I've got a couple slides and I'm almost out of time. So let's see, um, get your code up early. You may want to make two robots. So you got one to program on while you've got one to drive. Um, think about it or one to build hardware on while you drive. You really want drivers driving. Um, plan for dedicated time for this. Um, add functions gradually. Um, testing, 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 testing. You're going to need to do a lot of testing. Automate it as much as you can. Um, and sorry, I'm flipping through the last few slides. They'll be here. Document it all, right? Make notes in the code. Yes, you can put things in your notebook. Uh, actually, this year I understand less code in the notebook, but in your code, hey, what did you come up with? Who came up with it? What was the inspiration? What were you thinking about? Among other things, later when you look at that code and say, where the heck did this come from? What were we thinking? It'll help you to understand it in case you got to debug something, right? If there's something that's complicated, write it up. Um, the space for documentation doesn't cost anything in the code. It all gets compiled out, so use a bunch of it. Make backups. At least once a week, make a copy of your team code folder somewhere else, right? Preferably off your primary computer. Um, and if you share it, still make a backup somewhere because the shared version, somebody can overwrite things. And if you lose all your code, that's really painful. We've watched it happen way too many times. Go to your repository on first, right? Go to GitHub every week or so, check it. Um, 
check it a week and a half before your next match or next set of meets because you don't want to have to update it at the last minute. Um, one quick plug out here, there's these wonderful USB uh, two plug things. If you buy one of these and you plug it into your driver station, you just plug the joysticks in and you're done. There's no hub, there's nothing else. It's really one piece simple and they cost like six bucks a piece. They will die during the season, so buy two or three of them, but they're cheap and they're easy and they're wonderful. All right. Um, so that's my last suggestion for you. We're at the end of time. We're actually over by a minute or so. Uh, I thank you very much for your time. I'm glad um, at least one of you found it useful. Hopefully others did as well. Um, and we'll get the slide deck posted. Um, we'll try and get some code posted. If not, send me an email. I can send you copies of code. Um, do go look at the hardware thing from this morning. We had some really cool drivetrain ideas in that. Um, have a great season. And if I can be of further help, drop me a note. Thanks. Take care.